Ken Johnson, how goes it? It is going well. How are you, Dave? I'm doing great. I, I've been uh, wanting to talk to you for a number of years. I know I, I've uh, I've mentioned to you probably three or four times in the last few years, hey, how, when are we going to do a podcast together? And we just haven't figured out what to talk about until recently. But Ken is a friend of mine and he's, he's, a, uh, he's a former client. He's a husband. He's a dad. He's a, he's a retired entrepreneur and he's living up at his uh, newly built home. And God, it's in Maine. What, what, why am I blanking on the Bar Harbor, Maine? The reason I wanted to bring Ken on is he's he's one of my favorite people. He gave me the chance to uh, do some work with him. It was probably about nine years ago. I walked into his company. He did not know who I was. And for whatever reason, he was open to having a conversation. And we've just had a great relationship ever since. So you're two years technically out of the day-to-day -day of business, but your energy level is exactly the way it was when I met you back in 2015. So maybe we can start there. Where did this come from, the idea of wanting to create a company or work for yourself or build something from scratch? Where did that all come from? You know, I honestly don't think, I don't know that, I think I, I know I did that and I, and I did find at it, but it's, I didn't, we didn't start MAS because I just want to own a company. We started MAS because the other MAS collapsed. And I had no income, no source of income and, and four kids. And, you know, so a real need for money, um, as we all have. And I wasn't afraid to start a company. I'm probably naive and cocky enough to think, yeah, what the hell? I can do it. But that wasn't my goal at all. It was just, that's what I got to do. I had no other choice. So we remortgaged the home and did some things and, and started a company and then drove it. And then I think, so starting the company wasn't the goal, but then once, if I'm going to own a company, it's going to be the best company it can be. Um, and that took 20 years to, to, I think, make a great, I know, make a really good company. We were tech recruiters, high tech recruiters. So you know that world. And in, the, in 2000, 2001, when the towers came down, the, the dot-com bubble collapsed, um, the Y2K fizzled out. A lot of things came together where nobody was hiring engineers. And that's, we were in the business of selling engineers. And then, and so MAS, for those that don't know, was a healthcare staffing company. You had no experience with that. No, no. But I remember there was one company, God, I can't remember their name, in Mass, in, in New Hampshire that was really big in per diem staffing. So we went to one of these trade fairs and trade shows, and she said to us, oh, like laughed at us, you don't even know what you're doing. And we didn't, but we out hustled. We just... We were like naive and aggressive in high tech recruiting. You had to be really aggressive. We so we brought that aggressiveness to medical staffing, and we just we didn't know what we didn't know, which was a lot. And we charged, and we ran. She she was out of business like three years later. You, you resuscitated a a tech staffing company that was dead and turned it into a medical staffing company that exploded. And I, I say that because I'm when I met you, you as an organization, MAS was doing really, really well, and you were very, very busy. But in the time that we worked together, I want to say you tripled in size in, in a six or seven year period before you sold it. What's fascinating to me is, one, you started off with no experience, with no people, and you know you had to build it from scratch. But you grew this thing organically. How in God's name did you do that? Yeah, but we were so medical staffing is a 15 or was a 15 billion dollar a year industry. So, you know, we grew to 100 million dollars, which is great and is big, but that's still, I don't know what that is, half of a percent or something. So, you know, we grew because there was plenty of space to grow. At the end, the last few years, we were fueled by technology. So when we started it, there was no barrier to entry. We put up a shingle. We said, okay, we do medical staffing. We got on the phones, which is what we knew how to do. Developed a relationship with the nurse, developed a relationship with the facility, put them together. Boom. Repeat, 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 repeat. Not complicated, just brute force. I was on call. It's 24-7 because the nurses, I was on call for the first six years. So every day, all day, 24 hours a day for six years, working, working, working. You can see it now in hindsight. It's clear. Once Uber came out for taxis, it, w it wasn't hard to see how an Uber-like app in our industry would just connect the, the, the caregiver with a, with a client. 
and not put us out of business, but, you know, we still, they were our W-2 employees, but just facilitate that communication. At the end of the day, communication is everything. You know that. So we invested a lot of money for uh, a lot of money and the sentence, millions of dollars, which was a lot for anybody. And, but, but that once our company was tech fueled and a lot of our competitors weren't, it was game over. What about the people component? You had a lot of people. We had a lot of people. We had an interesting component. So that's where we met you. All great in their own right. As a team, that we were struggling together. I was involved in the, and we had started up tech again. So there was five of us, six of us, and uh, it was a mess. Brought you in and, um, and, and, you know, you helped us through a lot of that. Helped us see the issues. Um, and then helped us fix them, which was, you know, rearranging some folks' role. What's interesting about that is, and I, I appreciate you giving me some credit for helping, but at the same time, what I think sticks with me the most is when we first met, I didn't know you. I didn't know any of your, anybody on your team, even the person who brought me in. I didn't know, I didn't know that person. And what was amazing was the level of openness in the room, even though we didn't know each other. Uh, but the reality is, is even though we had started to do some work and it felt good, I fell on my face pretty quickly. And and you, I don't remember if you were actually in the room, but one of the first times I met your company, when, when it was on a 40 or 50 people in the room, I just kind of died on stage. The room like just shut down on me and it had never happened before. The next day I had come in for the second day and you and your management team were there and we sat down and I'll never forget Billy saying, yeah, yesterday was, uh, it was subpar. It was just a knife through my heart. <laughs> it was a knife through my heart. And I wanted to make things right. I just didn't know if, I didn't know if you guys wanted to make things right. The thing that has stuck with me for all these years is that you were committed to making things right. It wasn't done because of uh, one bad morning or one bad day. I'm just curious, because I've noticed that quality in you with everybody. Nothing's ever really done with you. And I'm just curious. I still, all these years later, I'm like, why the hell did you keep, I don't know, remaining uh, open-minded? It, it just, it just never, it, it was always a, something that, that it stuck with me. So I don't remember that fail, but I do, you probably think of that as being early on, but if you were talking to the whole team, you had already met the management team a few times at least. Yeah. And I think the primary goal initially with you was to get our management team functioning better and then you get me and all that i bring and it was like holy smokes and all i knew was our company so our company seemed normal or seemed like it was functioning well so then you came in and i and i the way i remember it is you had already had an impact now if i didn't think we needed an impact something must have resonated where it's like yeah maybe we are a little nutty maybe 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 we can function at a higher level and then you came in and saw that too so okay now you know, every day doesn't have to be perfect. And may maybe there was a day that was subpar, even though you don't like to hear that. Yeah, no, no, no. It, it, but it was it was great. It was great. It hurts to this day, but it was not wrong. And but you you maintained this level of commitment and belief that things could be better because you were always willing to look in the mirror. That's the that's the other thing is there was a lack of defensiveness, not only with you, but even with your team, a lack of defensiveness, even in the conversations. Uh, and a willingness to say, maybe, maybe I could be better, or maybe we need to do things differently and not, and, and you didn't feel the need to hold on to stuff. Well, so, so I'm 60 now at my age, companies have come and gone great companies. Well, GE is actually on its way back, but GE was the greatest company in the world when I was in college, Jack Welsh. And then they went to crap blockbuster, I think is, I mean, you get a company of Sears. Sears invented the web. It was called the Sears catalog. It wasn't online, but if they had thought, anyway, there's all kinds of, and, and in my mind, companies come and companies go. They just do. It doesn't matter how great the very best of the best go, or at least go through pain. So the way to avoid that is to construct, to try to out evolve it. I mean, I know MAS has a, has a shelf life. I don't know what it is. It's going fine. It's going to go hopefully for a long, long time, but you, 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 that gets narrow. If you don't change your toast. 
So, you know, you brought up the idea of constantly looking and thinking and how do we get better? How do we get better? We could be a nine point and 95 out of 100. Well, let's 97. Come on, let's get there. Mm -hmm. Because we have to because we are not perfect. No company is. And instead of dwelling on, well, part of dwelling on what you suck at is to get better at it to get to be even better. Mm -hmm. Like, why wouldn't you? I remember that with we, we lost some key people at various times, every company loses somebody key. And and to be oh, shoot, Sally just gave notice. Okay, here's what's going to happen. We got three things that are, that are we're either going to get better, get worse, or stay the same. Those are the only logical three things that can happen anytime anybody goes. So Sally went, oh, we're going to miss Sally. Okay, so everybody here thinks we're going to be worse. But guess what our job is? To be better, maybe the same, but if we can pull it off, let's get better. Because mm -hmm. we didn't bring that on ourselves or, you know, whatever. It is. It is what it is. So now we're going to replace Sally and we're going to get somebody better. How do you maintain that, Ken? So many people focus on Sally screwed us. Sally, we're held back because of what Sally did, what Jimmy did, what Johnny did, or we're held back by the mistakes we made last year. And I, I, I mean this, you're, you're never held back by even when a mistake was made, even when a decision was delayed, even when you shouldn't have done something, you still maintain this focus on where you could be or where you're going. Where does that come from? Listen, if you're in our company and you make the same mistake three times in a row, we're probably going to have a different conversation. A mistake. I remember Don, you know, Don, Don's fantastic. Don was so fundamental in, in a lot of our success. And she came in, sure, she was going to be fired. And I don't, again, I don't remember what it was. And she, she was like the relief on her face. You're not firing me. So what the hell am I going to like? That never even didn't enter my mind. It wasn't that she did was immoral or something like she just made a mistake trying something that doesn't work out doesn't even mean you did anything wrong. It just meant that, you know, you got an experiment and the experiment failed and you learned something from it. She's way more valuable today going forward than she was yesterday, because guess what mistake was coming? The one she was about to make. My my experience, and again, without without even the specific people naming names, it's that there was an environment or a culture that allowed people to kind of put stuff on the table. Even if it didn't sound right, it was safe to do that. I've sat in the room with you and your leadership team where things got, you know, uh, in, in a healthy way, contentious, but it always felt clean. It felt like yeah. stuff is on the table and nobody's hurt by it. There was a safety in that. That's, that's, that's not easy to create. What, what's your take on that? We really wanted to create a, an environment where the leadership team, you know, to be able to argue and 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 go through stuff. And I remember pre, I remember knowing I'm going to light up somebody and, but they're going to live through, you know, it's going to be okay. People have to see that anything can, you can say and do anything in here. And this is our safe zone and you're going to be safe, but it's not going to feel it for a little while. And anyway, and we did that and, and, and it took time you know, you can say those words, but is it really safe? And then once the team saw that it was that when that started happening really organically, like you said, yeah. now you did something. Now the five of us together added up, add up all the IQs. Now we're really freaking smart. And now we're hitting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think everybody was so uh, willing to look in the mirror at what they were or what they weren't, what they are and who they're not. And that, I I talk about this all the time. Like I even on a on a personal level, I I know that my best relationships are with the people in my life that I can disagree with. Those that we we can have a little bit of a rub and and yet it's totally fine. And, I, and that's what I thought was so fascinating about the culture that that you guys created because it was not only that healthy debate and you know disagreement at times, but it wasn't at the expense of growth. I would say because we did it. Mm. I would say it was because partly, partly, I mean, there were other uh, reasons, but it's not like we started the company and then you, you, you hired this management team. No, no, no. The, the, they had come in halfway through, which means others had come in and gone. So it's not, you know, to get the right team, you got to get the right team. And you don't, you would, I don't know what the statistics are. Half of the hires are right. That means, you know, the people we're not talking about are the ones that weren't good. 
what's right? You know, every company has its own version of right. And I know it's a different definition everywhere you go. And there's no such thing as right. But there are certain things that you look for or have looked for in people. What are those things? Work hard. I remember one of the first lessons with you is you got to have one non-negotiable. You know, everybody says they want honesty, they want integrity, they want hardware, they want all the, you want five of these things. Which one will you not live without? And mine is hard work. You got to give me your best effort. Otherwise, I'm just not interested. Like I was financially motivated to be there Saturdays and Sundays and, and to care as much as I did. They care just as much. And yeah, and it, it came from almost a purer place than than it did for me why why do you think they cared so much i think it's human nature i think people want to i think most people want to be like that they want to care they want to do their best they they're driven um you know this is the leadership team these people and i would tell them that when i would expect a lot from them you're here for a reason you know they were the best of the best in my opinion i feel like that's just their nature they weren't gonna not care about what they did well, I wonder, I wonder if some of it had to do, again, this is me as an outsider looking in, just an analysis. I get to work with a lot of different people in different industries, different companies. So when I listen to you talk, it you do sound, you do sound different. Um, and what has always fascinated me is you're able to see, or into this day, see the best in people. So no matter what their uh, weaknesses, in, in quotes, are, or what holds them back, you're a, you've always been able to focus on what propels them ahead or what they what they bring to the table. And you're very you've always been very accepting of maybe what other people wouldn't tolerate. You're accepting that maybe they're not good at this or maybe they are a moody person or maybe they do get hot headed. But but you're able to see what they bring to the table and how that exceeds the value of maybe what they don't do well. Um, that to me has always been just such a fascinating thing that you were able to focus on somebody's strengths more than dwell on what they don't do. Is that an intentional thing? Is that an unconscious thing? Is that a, I guess I follow, I know what you're talking about, but it's certainly not conscious. It's just, and if it's, if it's relatively unique, I wouldn't know that again. I just know me. So I feel like it makes sense to me that. So when you're coaching soccer, you got a bunch of little seven-year-olds playing soccer and you got this one or two parents that's yelling to the kid to do this or as soon as the kid kicks the ball too high, that's too high, don't ever do that. And the, the parent that's yelling at the kid about when they do well or not do well, the kid's reaction is almost always going to be, if the kid doesn't like, nobody likes being yelled at for a mistake. So how do you not make a mistake in soccer? You don't touch the ball. And like the center midfield, who's got his foot on the ball a lot of the game, probably makes more mistakes added up than everybody else in the game. Also does a lot of great things, but has bad touches and bad kicks. That person probably doesn't have a mom or dad screaming every time they make a mistake. You, like when the kid has a bad touch, they know it and they react. Now, if you got to coach them up, up a little bit on the side, so I, I don't know why I tell you that whole story, but to say I I don't I just don't think it's particularly effective to harp on the negative. It's probably more effective to yell brilliant when a kid does something well. And if you wanted to do it more, like a brilliant through pass. All right, let's talk about that. We're not going to talk about the other things that got goofed up because you know what we all saw it. You saw it too. Uh, you know you can deal with it. In my opinion, it's probably more effective to highlight and to reward. And to get excited about the positive, and you'll see more of it, and that'll almost like drown out the negative crap. You remind me, I uh, I'm a, I'm a loud parent in the stands, to be honest. With you. <laughs> and um, and we had a conversation at the house. I, I I get so caught up in whatever game I'm watching. It doesn't really matter what it is, whether my oldest yeah. was wrestling, or my middle guy was playing hockey, and my daughter's playing basketball. I can't stop talking, and most of what I'm saying is I'm almost observing out loud you know, get to open space or, you know, uh, leverage your teammates, you know, use your teammates, be a good teammate. So, but it's loud. And my wife at times will say, all I can, you're the only voice that I can hear in the stands. And I always say, but I'm, I'm trying to encourage the kids. I'm trying to encourage the kids. And uh, so the other day I said, you know what, I'm going to stand by myself. If, if it's uncomfortable, I'll go stand alone. I won't talk to anybody. And I had two parents come up to me and they said, 
why aren't you in the stands today? I'm like, I think I'm being too loud. And they said, what are you talking about? That's what we come here for. It's encouraging. So I say that not to defend myself, although maybe indirectly I am, but I'm not afraid to talk about what isn't happening. If there's a, if there's a player not passing, I will say, look for your teammates. If there's a player not running, I'll say, keep moving. But generally speaking, I always felt that that's how you led as well. You weren't afraid to address what wasn't happening, but you weren't punishing for it. But look, but when you say look for your teammates, that's different than saying, why'd you do that? But, you know, that's that's coaching. That I think is required. Um, I'm talking about the people that are just harping on the negative. And you make me think of, you know, talking about sports. I said the brilliant. I got, when I was coaching this, the kids' soccer teams, one of, the, I think Scotty's team gave me a shirt that just said brilliant because I would yell that. And you would yell all kinds of things. Because if you're just praising, first of all, that's not necessarily good. It becomes, um, it can it can seem fake. It certainly if you're praising when it's not warranted. Like you can't just say, oh well, you know, that was unbelievable when it wasn't. Right. Um, because then it then it just turns into noise. You know, where people you just have an instinct and you just interact with people. And the, the people that I worked with, I was just interacting with. And you know, a lot of it wasn't overly thought out. It was just this is how I we interacted with each other. And yeah. mostly positive things were happening. So we were mostly talking about positive to what the point I was talking about before, you know, we were, we were always focused on being better. So we probably had to look at and think about the things we could do better more than most, but that's, I mean, that was our job. Yeah. I, and I, and that, that to me ties back to, you just, you have that mindset of, of, of abundance. There's always an opportunity to grow. There's always an opportunity to come up with a new idea or, or make an adjustment and, not, and nothing. You, you get this ability to let go and see potential. And you, um, I'm only bringing this up because you brought it up when we talked uh, last week, you had referenced that you stopped drinking years ago. Um, and I, I had said to you like that to me, I wonder if, if your ability to walk away from something that was a habit at the time, first of all, not easy to do, you were able to kind of just make that decision, walk away from that. And it had a phenomenal impact on your life and move on from it and replace that with something else. I wonder how much that ties to your ability to walk away from a company now, or your ability to manage the pan through the pandemic when things were really uncertain you're able to kind of face adversity accept it and then move on from it how much does does your choice to move on from alcohol how much has that impacted just your ability to lead a company and people i don't know i don't know exactly but i bet it's significant because it was so it is very empowering um 17 years ago Sue's, we had the four kids and Sue basically said, we're all done with it. You know, it's the booze or it's me and the kids, but I'm not, we're not, I don't want to live like this with these kids. Um, and she deserves just a ton of credit for that. Cause that was a, you know, we had good kids, we were making money. We were at a, at a new house at that time. Um, for her to protect to and she was honest i mean this is when not words she didn't say this a lot i mean absolutely she would have done that so um and then i quit drinking and that was hard and hard, you know, really really hard to do and i think i i talked to you about this before but it took close to a decade to get past you can you can withhold you can have willpower and you can withhold something from yourself that you want for a time but in in my opinion and I don't study this I all I know is my experience was that's not going to happen forever um you so so when I over time in hindsight I can say I crossed over to where I I just don't want to drink now um the phrase I keep using is I'm not going to wake up and drink a glass and a gallon of gasoline either. I'm not worried about that. I'm like, it's the same thing to me. And I honestly believe that I don't want to drink and my life probably because of, but at least also got so much better. I had more energy, more time, a better relationship with my kids, with my wife. 
with everybody, work got good. Like that was so, it was very successful. So I, so the lesson I learned is you can make a big change and it works out great. Um, a big change. So then fast forward to 2021, I sell my company, not just any company, but a company that I literally the last couple of years was working seven days a week at, not because I had to, because I loved it. I loved everything about it. The kids were out of the house. I, you know, there was, I, I, I was just so absorbed in MAS and then we sold it and I had something else to do, but I had been through that. Like, holy shit, uh, can I live without this? Right. Once, you know, once with booze and once with, with the company. And the answer is absolutely. Not only can you live without it, you can thrive without it. You can have a better life without it. If you ask me right now, when, you know, what's the happiest you've ever been in your life? It's today. It's right now. It legitimately, the last three years have been the happiest of my life. The thing is, if you asked me that 10 years ago, it had been the same answer. Or five years ago, same answer. And hopefully five years from now, same answer. I don't even... So... Uh, you know, I don't know where I'm going with all that, but it it was the answer is it was absolutely significant. It was very empowering because that you said it was hard. That was no joke to do. That was extremely. It was the hardest thing I've ever done, far and away. Um, and yet it's doable, and what, it this it, it's and it's fantastic. What was the hardest? part of that i i mean we there's a ton of alcoholism on my side of the you know on actually on both sides of our families yeah. uh we thank thankfully in our we don't have we don't have the issues at in our house but we've i've, I've i saw a lot of it growing up you know yeah. family etc and most of uh i don't know that there's an example of anybody that overcame it on my side of the family um on my wife's side there's been people who have who have moved beyond it what was the hardest part though what was the well, initially it was just doing like, so I had tried to quit by myself for a couple of years. Um, I mean, I remember I would wake up and I wasn't, I'd go to the store on the weekend and I wasn't buying booze. I wasn't buying booze. I wasn't buying booze. And I didn't, and I'd come out and I'd be putting the groceries in the car and there it would be. And I didn't even like, it just happened whether I liked it or not. And And I, on my own, I just could not shake it. I knew I needed to, you feel shitty about yourself. Um, it, it got yeah but then with the impetus from sue's like all right now i got some now somebody's on to me which i was i was great at hiding stuff oh phenomenal so but now she's on to me and and i made a, a promise that i would do this either that or you know we were, i was gonna have to go to a something i was gonna have to i i was gonna this was gonna happen and i you know you're confident enough i'm gonna do it and and then you could then I could do it because it wasn't just about me anymore, and she was watching, you know, the, the days of sneaking around. And so at first I just needed a cop, really. I needed a cop that wouldn't let me get away with it because I would have got away with it if I could. Right. Um, and like I said before, it took maybe a decade until that wasn't needed anymore mm -hmm. at all. But if, I mean, it's a long time. You hear somebody quote, oh, he's been dry for three months. Oh, okay, that that's good because you don't get to 10 years without the first three months. But, um, and that's probably some of the habit, some of the habitual, some of the physiological things. You Okay, you've threw a lot, but it's the battle, in my opinion, is psychological and you haven't even begun yet. Um, you're still wrestling with God, do I want to live a life without it? Am I still the same? Like all those things about just not wanting, like I'm depriving myself, but I have to, but I really don't want to. And there's a party, there's a celebration. It's hard to to not drink in America and in, in well, we, all I know is America. It's in this society where you know your toast and the champagne toasts and, and all this stuff. So, so that just takes time. To actually, not to say to yourself that I can't, but to actually really just not want it. To to know that you're better without it. Mm -hmm. To know, like, I'll be happier today. Suze is gone, let's say, I could drink today. I don't want to. I'm going to have a better day, much more fun day out in Acadia, out in the park, than I am sitting around drinking, waking up with a hangover. You know, God yeah. damn, I don't need that. I what? don't want it. 
what was the first new habit that you developed that filled the space that maybe booze was filling? The, first of all, the first thing for me is the energy. Like it, it's amazing how much uh, it saps from you. Um, the energy. Uh, the, yeah. So I don't know that I had a new habit. I mean, I didn't, I don't have hobbies. I do now. I mean, I'm all hobbies now. But um, but back when I was working, it was work. I could I could just spend that much more time at work and loved it. Loved, loved, loved it. People only worked every day. Oh, I must have, no, I wasn't toiling at all. I God is all I thought about. I loved that place. And working on spreadsheets and interacting with people and everything that was involved. Um so I guess I could just pour more into that. Mm-hmm. I don't think I developed some other habit. Uh you know, I don't smoke. I didn't all of a sudden. Yeah, there's no other habit that I can think of. Okay, so then that's that makes it even more impressive. So when you you consciously made the decision several years ago, you I remember you saying to me, "Look, I can only take this thing so far. I feel like I've I've given everything I can to get this company to a place, and I don't know how to get it beyond this place. I have to bring on another partner." And then, so that, that, that kind of was, if I'm saying this, if I'm, if I'm articulating this correctly, that was the impetus for ultimately seeking out another partner and selling it. Because it, in your mind, you had done everything that you could possibly do to get it to this point, And it was now time for you to go do something else. So the very thing work that replaced alcohol was now going to go away. And then you say, well, I didn't have any real hobbies. So now you're reinventing a life with no alcohol with no work, with no responsibility professionally anymore. I mean, or, or reduced responsibility professionally. I know you're still an investor, but now you have all this free time, like how, and you're psyched, your energy level. I've, I haven't seen you phys- other than on zoom. I haven't seen you for a couple of years. He's same, same guy, except for whatever reason you shaved your head. You had a perfectly, <laughs> fine yeah. but you look great by the way, but, but you, you're, you're the same guy like your level of energy and commitment and and enthusiasm is, is like, it's the same thing. So how did you transition from letting go of work to reinventing a life with your wife up in Acadia, uh, Bar Harbor, and then, and then feeling this level of energy and commitment and enthusiasm? What is it that you did? Like, um, let me shut up for it. Let me say one more thing. I've met a number of people in your situation who built and sold companies in the last 10 years, and they did very well for themselves. Financially, they did well. They built companies. They, they, they afforded people the opportunity to build great lives for themselves. And then they're done with it. And a lot of them are not, I don't want to say they're not happy, but there's an emptiness to them. They don't know how to fill their time or what they're supposed to do now. And a lot of them are not old. You're young. And some of them are younger than you. And and they're saying, what do I do with my time? And they don't know. And so you said you didn't have any hobbies. Here I am all over the place with this. How did you now reinvent yourself? Like what, what was like the biggest wake up call once you retired? You have, you have plenty of money. You don't have to do anything now if you don't want to, but Mm -hmm. I don't think the money is, it's it's only going to fill the void for so long. Right. Yeah, no, money Money is just, money means you don't have to earn money in whatever you do. You got to do something all day. But like, as, you're, as you were just talking, I felt myself grinning because I the excitement. So you said, it was funny, you said, now you don't have alcohol and you don't have MAS. What? Well, I mean, the world is so much bigger than booze and one company. So um, yeah, those two things are gone. There's about a million other things I can get myself in the midst of. And just the idea, and now you have the time and the money to do it. So to not to have some money um, just means I don't have to do something that's going to be financially successful. I want to do something that's successful because I want to be successful, but I don't give it, I don't care if I fail. Who cares? Um, and if I try 10 things and fail at seven of them and you're good at three. Okay, well, we'll in five years we'll probably mostly talk about those three. Anyway, um, to me that is exhilarating and thrilling. Um, the idea of well, now what can I do? Are my 
right now the builder's still here. He's working on a hobby house. He's going to have a whole paint, uh, a, an art studio. I mean, I really want to, for me particularly, explore the artistic side, if I have one, of 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 myself because I've never, I've never explored that. I've never done anything artistic. I've never thought I was at all artistic and now I have the time and the energy and the money to it's like, well, let's find out if that's true. Um, I, I play guitar now. I learned that's so cliche, but anyway, I learned that. And um, the funny thing is it's been two years. If you listen to me play, you would say, I think you've been doing that for about three or four months. The reality is it's like two years. So that's how bad I am at it. But who cares? Like, I'm not going on a recital. So um, I just think the way you described where I was, I just felt myself getting excited thinking, now what? And now what can be anything? And that's to to the degree there's folks out there that um, are like, oh, I don't know what to do. Yeah, okay, but... That's probably true, but you got to do something or you want to do something. And the, and the possibilities are almost limitless. Now, in my case, back to the booze, I had some success dropping something that I thought I couldn't live without. And then now MAS, oh, I, 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 like I said, I'm there seven days a week. What the hell am I going to do now? Well, let's just stop that. And then you, you fill the void. You've got all this space and all this time and still the energy, as you mentioned, and and you can put it anywhere. And you know what? You don't have to be right. I remember initially thinking I was going to make wooden watches. It turns out I'm not nearly detail oriented enough or specific enough. That's just not my nature. Like that would have made. I read. You know what? I read like a half of a chapter on how to do. It. I said this is this is not me. This is ridiculous. But and other things I failed at. But. I, I I have it's just going to be so cool. I can't wait for the art studio and the pottery. We took a pottery class. We got painting class coming up in in uh, adult ed. And we're just doing stuff, and and we're like we're innkeepers. We had oh, close to a hundred visitors here last summer. We've got this great house, um, great spot, a vacation spot. So we live here, but but you know our families come and friends vacation with us which has been awesome. I, I know Su Susan's family, I and mean, we've been married, I don't know, 30 something years. I've known her 40 years. I know people in her family better now um, just over the last couple of years because of their visits up here than, I, than in the 38 years prior to that. Because they come, they stay a weekend. We have conversations that um, are positive or negative that, you know, aren't just, oh, the weather, this, oh, the turkeys aren't going to cook. Okay, we'll see you next Thanksgiving. You know, it, it's, they're much deeper. They're fantastic. She's got a great family and I really have enjoyed getting to know them. One, I have more time. I'm not just work, but also the visits here have been, um, have been fantastic. I don't even know what you asked. But. No, 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 no. Well, I just, just how, how have you managed to fill your time after letting those things go? And I love your answer. You know, you can't be afraid. If anybody's sitting there saying, well, what am I going to do? Then you, what are you afraid of? Yeah. What, why, why would you be afraid of just trying? Like, like there's so many dream a little, just dream. What do you want to be? What, what's your goal? Maybe it's a challenge. I, I haven't done anything with, with non-for-profits you can do with it. God, there's so many people that could use help there. Fine. You do that. You do, like I said, the art, the, the, the athletics, um, you know, I'm probably not trying out for the Patriots, but whatever, you just do whatever the hell you want to do. Who cares yeah. what it is? Yeah. The thing that's interesting to me is I don't think this has anything to do with, um, say the financial security that comes from selling a company. I just think this is like, you learn this before because mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm certainly not in your situation. I'm not hurting, but I'm not in your situation. So I, I work and I love to work and I hope I work until I'm dead, but the thing that has helped me along the way is learning to let go of stuff. And sometimes it's learning to let go of financial security. And sometimes it's learning to let go of a job or learning to let go of a client. There's something exhilarating about walking away from what makes me comfortable. Or, you know, I, I just recently, um, I'm taking a break from a, a client right now. And I I was, I tell my wife everything and I'm like, I feel so good having this space here because mm -hmm. as soon as I open the space in my mind, new clients fill it. 
or new opportunities right. fill it. And she's going through the same thing with with her with her job. And I say, you know, when you walk, when you when you step aside from something that isn't working, like say for example, that client's not working, go focus over here, watch what happens. Go give something to somebody over here, watch what happens. And I've just seen her in her last couple of weeks, business opportunities open up for her because she's let go of these things over here. Now that, that that's maybe on the negative side, but there's just something so empowering about being able to let go in, in some ways, you know, like we, this is morbid, but I think about death, for example, it's like, it's going to happen. And like, that's the worst thing that can happen to any of us as we die or the people that we love die, but that's going to happen. And you know what life goes on. And if you don't learn to see what's still possible, you know, you're going to get stuck. And I just think that that to me is the theme. Like, you know, some people work for money. And then when they don't have to work for the money anymore, they, do, they, they haven't figured out how to replace that time or they don't realize that there are all these opportunities to keep doing stuff. So I just think that for whatever reason, I, I believe that was in you from the get go. And it's probably stronger now, but it just it's an it's an interesting quality. But, you know, what? it's funny. You just talk about death. Um not but so you 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 were writing our obituaries by living so my goal is to knock mas down to the third or fourth paragraph yeah yeah because right now it's it's hard to talk about it's hard for me to think about my you know certainly the family would be first and then but the next thing you'd mention was mas he started a company blah 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 blah, blah. Yeah. well how wouldn't it be awesome if that's like the third or fourth best thing i did instead of the second um and so, and that can happen, yeah. but it's up to me. Like right now I got what, 30 years, let's say I'm 60, I'm, but I'm, I'm trying to be healthy. I'm going to live 90. I might, I might hit a hundred. So I got 30 or 40 years, but in that time I got to jam in something really good or a couple of really cool things because I don't want MAS to be my obituary because that's already done. I don't. So that could be my goal. If you think about it that way, you're like, okay, what am I going to get at? And and what's it going to say? I mean, I you don't want to like plan around that, but but it can say anything and it has not been written. Only part of it's been written. Oh, so that's so great. It's so good. But that, that's the thing. It's like you know, your your gift is is not is not in what you did with the company, but it's what you did for those people or the opportunities you created for, you know, whatever, employees, yourself, your family and all that. And to take that and to continue to do it in other parts of your life, it, it's, you're right. I mean, no one's ever going to remember where we worked. No one's ever going to remember how much we made. It, it's just, it, it's, it's what are their memories of you when you were around with them? You know, was, were you a plus or a minus? Were you like, are they going to remember yeah. you in a favorable way? And I mean, I, I, I mean, you you and I haven't worked together in a couple of years, but I, it's it it just it's like I just consider you my friend. I don't consider you a, a yeah. client. You just happen to you just happen to do business with me for a period of time. But that's the gift you're giving to everybody. When you said to me you didn't spend a lot of time with your friends while you were working, I'm like, man, they missed out on on knowing that about you. And now you get the chance now to do that with other people and all these guests that come to your house. I just think it's so cool. Yeah, it is. It, that, that's been because work was my social. Uh, outlet um so you say i didn't spend much time with my friends i didn't even have any friends so now i'm making friends up here which is you know unique for me but anyway and 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 the family that doesn't have a choice but to spend i do enjoy really really enjoy conversations and spending time with people it'll make sue's nuts but someone will stop and just chatting and chatting and chatting and then i just like that i like learning about things and people and hearing their stories and and this life now gives me the opportunity to do that a great opportunity to do that give me uh give me one or two things that you 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 wrap this up in the in, in any, any way you want I, i'm first of all i just want to say i appreciate you taking the time i've i i knew this would be a fun conversation it's my favorite one so far i just i've done 137 or whatever of these things but I've just, I've always felt fueled by my conversations with you. So, so I, I really appreciate you coming on here, Ken. But what is it that you think, what have you learned or what's a lesson in life that you learned along the way that you think you you just want to share with somebody else? If, if you, you can take us home anyway, yeah. any way you want to go. I don't know if I'm that, um, 
I would say to me, the biggest fear would be to not try. I'd far, and I, I don't think this is particularly unique, but I think that I would, I would hate the idea of not trying something versus trying it and failing. I remember I got involved with one company agency leads basically for that reason. It, it didn't end up succeeding, but, and in hindsight, it's like, ah, that was kind of stupid, but you know what? The, the idea that I didn't get behind that and it succeeded petrified, freaking terror. And, and I, I would much rather it have gone the way it did, which is I got behind it and it still, and it failed. Fine. Fail, check. Boom. Failed. I don't care. At least I, at least I got in the game. So um, that would be the thing. Like the, you, you reference people that find themselves in a position similar to mine and are, 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 what are, are unsure of what to do. Stop thinking about it. Just freaking do something and, and don't worry. It's like, it just takes care of itself. Just try stuff, fail 10 times. You'll succeed three and those will be good. I love it. There it is. Thank you, my friend. I, I totally, uh, I, I totally appreciate this conversation. It was awesome. And I hope we can do it again. I really want to do it again. If you're open to it. Yeah. I, uh, my pleasure. I love talking, especially about myself. So anyway, it's, it's good stuff. Good to talk to you. Good to connect. All right, Ken. Thank you so much. Cheers, Dave.